Welcome, Dr. Hahn. It's wonderful to be with you, Marilyn. It truly is a kind of miracle that we can do this from thousands of miles away. It is, and we're very excited that we're going to do it all again in about a week's time um, at the Parish Renewal Conference. So, um, so thank you so much for making yourself available for that. And everyone, when I spoke about um, us having this conversation today, everybody I spoke to wanted to thank you for everything you've done to provide these um, very rich and very accessible biblical resources for ordinary Catholics. Um, well, I'm grateful. What a joy it is to share and what it is a joy to, it's an unspeakable privilege, not only to share, but also to experience this grace of ongoing conversion so that we're not just trying to reach them. We realize that we are them and Christ is trying to reach us and draw us ever deeper and I think that's what makes it so exciting and infectious, too, in a safe way. <laughs> so your keynote talk will be on the topic Evangelising Catholics, a culture in need of the gospel. And without giving away everything you want to say next week, can you tell us what is evangelization and do Catholics need to be evangelised or do the evangelising? Well, what I hope to share on uh, Saturday, August 20th, is... Um, in a certain sense, divided up into two parts. On the one hand, there is the first century, and on the other hand, there is the 21st century. Back in the first century, as Jesus was preparing to ascend into heaven, he gave to the disciples what we call the Great Commission, and that is, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And I want to look at what that means, because Jesus didn't simply say, make disciples within all nations, but rather make disciples of all nations. Now, he's not talking about states, secular nation states. The term in the Greek that we find is ethne. So we're talking about ethnic groups, ethnicity, or what we might describe most accurately as cultures. And so it's not just evangelizing individuals, it's also the evangelization of culture, because we as human beings are not just rational animals, we're also social, political animals. That is, we're culture, we're enculturated. And so we've discovered now in the 21st century that if we are not evangelizing cultures, then the cultures are going to devangelize us and our families as well. And that's what will bring us to the 21st century, where we find ourselves still in the midst of what Pope St. John Paul II called the new evangelization. Now, when he used that term over 40 years ago, it was in his own homeland of Poland, and he broke script. He sort of hmm, improvised on the spot and spoke of the need for a new evangelization because he was looking out on a sea of faces. His own fellow Polish Catholics had been ravaged by the Nazis and by the Soviets, and so he recognized the need to re-evangelize those who had been de-Christianized. Now, People in Poland were not de-Christianized, say, as much as we have been in the West. So when he came back to America uh, a couple of years later, he spoke of the new evangelization again and then again and again. It became really the single highest priority of his pontificate. But once again, it was about re-evangelizing the de-Christianized. And I won't go into the details that I will be covering in my talk, but I would say this, that you know, we, we talk about keeping the faith, but it's really hard to keep the faith if you don't know how to share it. And in fact, what I have found is that when people learn how to share the faith, they also discover not only how to keep it better, but they discover that they own it more. That once you get to the point where you can share it with other people, you're going to see in their eyes, on their faces, and in their lives the transforming power of the gospel that we can sometimes take for granted. And so when you learn how to share the faith through evangelization, you not only learn how to keep it better, but you also appreciate it more. And I think it's that feedback loop that I hope to capture, because what we want to do is to identify the basic steps of how to go about evangelizing, because for us as Catholics, it's different, I think, than it is for non-Catholics, for evangelicals, for fundamentalists, and for historic Protestants, who generally emphasize something that is profoundly true, and that is how to evangelize in a kind of quick moment, 
you know, in the elevator exchange, as it's been called, you know, what we described back in my Protestant days as the four spiritual laws, God loves you, you've sinned, Christ died for your sin, and so now you've got to choose what to do with that gift. You've got to believe. You're invited to faith. And all of that is true, and when the elevator door is open, you can certainly lead that person in prayer into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but for Catholics, evangelization involves much more than a personal relationship with Jesus. I mean, that's the, that's the first step. That's not the, the finish line or the goal. And so I think back to when I first had a personal relationship with this really gorgeous gal on our college campus named Kimberly. But a personal relationship was the starting point, not the end. And so we entered into something we call courtship through dating. But that too wasn't the end. We entered into something more serious called engagement, but that also was transitory. And so finally, you know, 43 years ago, we entered into something we call the covenant of marriage. And so courtship, engagement, and marriage sort of reflects how it's a personal relationship, but a whole lot more. And that is how in the early church, they evangelized a pagan culture, imperial Rome. And when you had an initial conversion, then you entered into a commitment called the catechumenate. That is, you became a catechumen so you could learn the Lord's Prayer, you could learn scripture and all of that. But even that was a means to an end because the goal was, of course, to be baptized, to be confirmed, to receive First Holy Communion, to enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb and to experience the love of Christ for his bride. And so the analogy with marriage works very well, but doubly so. Because once you get married, you, of course, cross the finish line and you start to raise a family. You start to celebrate more and more anniversaries. But you also discover that the need to fall in love is not something that is simply in the rear of your mirror. It's something that is ongoing. There's a sense in which you can fall out of love. And so you've got to fall back into love. And, you know, when I became a Catholic in 1986, Kimberly didn't become one until 1990. And those four years were really difficult. And after she became a Catholic, we thought it was like happy days are here again. But instead, we discovered that a lot of the bad habits that we had acquired needed to be unlearned. And so we went to marriage counseling and we were basically taught the basics of how to fall back in love, date nights, you know, and spending time together. And, you know, we ended up not only falling back in love, but finding a level of friendship that was deeper than what we had fallen out of. And now I would say after these 40 plus years, this has grown to the point where, I mean, nothing has been fulfilling in my life as much as my friendship with, with Kimberly. And yet nothing has been as frustrating at times. Nothing has made me feel more inadequate. And so what I think we see is an earthly analogy of a heavenly mystery. And that is the reality of our relationship with Christ which is a covenant, not just a contract. So it's an extended family. It's not just me and Jesus and you and Jesus. And so it's something that is meant to impact culture. It's meant to transform not only the lives of individuals and married couples, but families and neighborhoods and all of the rest. And so what I hope to do is to take the basic steps that will walk us through how it is as Catholics, we can not only Lead, lead somebody from unbelief to initial conversion to catechesis, where they learn the scriptures, and then the sacraments where they enter into communion. But in effect, we recognize the need, as John Paul did, to re-evangelize the de-Christianized, but that means re-evangelizing the baptized. You know, And so we recognize that a lot of people are a part of the church as the bride of Christ, but are out of touch with Jesus. They're out of love with the Lord. And so the opportunities are practically unlimited, but the potential is as well, because I think what we're talking about doing is sort of awakening a slumbering giant, and not just in the U.S., but also in Australia. But the forces that are against us here as well as there are pretty considerable. The forces of secularization, the forces of devangelization. We're not just talking about a post-Christian culture. We're really talking about one that is becoming increasingly anti-Christian and toxic. And so we have a lot of lessons to learn from the ancient church where they took on the Roman Empire, which was in a way a culture of death. 
pre-Christian to be sure, but utterly pagan. And what were the chances of success back then? Practically nil. And yet they succeeded. And so what are the chances of our success? It seems like they're practically nil as well, but I'm convinced that if we really allow ourselves to be transformed, we can become instruments of transformation for many, many other people as well. So these are some of the highlights that I want to touch upon, but especially by coming back again to what Jesus said to them and what Jesus is saying to us, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He doesn't say it will be given, but only at the end of time. So if he has all authority in heaven and earth, what difference does that make? Well, he makes it clear. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, not just in nations, but even the ethnic groups themselves can be experiencing transformation or ongoing conversion. And he says, basically, pull up, you know, he says, pull no punches, you know, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you, not just the overlapping values that secularists already recognize, but even the things that Jesus taught that we know are going to be provocative, that are going to cause a reaction and all of the rest, because in that sense, we're going to be forced to depend upon the Holy Spirit and not just our own techniques and gimmicks. And that's why he goes on to say, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because the sacraments alone are what really make our evangelization stick and last and be supernatural and not just rhetorical techniques that we polish and employ with various groups of people. And then at the end of the Great Commission, the most reassuring words of all come, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age which points not only to baptism, but also to his real presence in the Holy Eucharist, which ends up, I think, becoming not only the source and the summit of our lives as Catholics, but also the source and the summit of the new evangelization itself. So that's it in a nutshell. That's the, basically the outline of what I hope to present. But then I also want to sprinkle a lot of practical examples and personal anecdotes in there as well. Well, that's that's fantastic. Really looking forward to hearing those those basic steps that you're you're going to to lay out for us and just really gently lead us along that. But you've given the grand vision there, which is super exciting as well. Um, I was going to ask you, Dr. Han. Now you've touched on so many of my questions, so now I'm all excited. I want all the answers for these straight away. But you touched on a few things. So one was about the culture, and so I'm going to jump down to this. So you. Um, as we know, trends in American culture do tend to flow on to other Western countries, including us here in Australia. And it looks like um, US society is becoming more and more divided over issues of race, gender, and such, um, along with the rise of what's been termed work culture. Would you agree? And is this part of the, 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 the tide that you say that we're kind of um, battling against a little? Or do you see so any signs of, of an end? to so-called workism and the culture wars? Well, I mean, these are good questions. They're hard ones too, Marilyn. But I would say, first of all, yes, I do agree wholeheartedly. In fact, emphatically, that what we face here is a, a tide of secularism that is practically a tsunami of secularism and of a sort that is more consciously aware of how anti-Christian it is. And so I suspect that in... Australia and many other parts of the world, there is a spillover effect. That is uh, that kind of secularization because of Hollywood, because of the internet, and because of so many other factors that are unique to American culture. Uh, this is having, you know, you can just sense that this is having a, a great effect. Uh, it's like a pebble and just, you know, sending out ripples everywhere. Uh, on the other hand, I would also say this, that as the bad is getting worse faster than we imagined, the good is getting better much more than I expected. So I look back on when I became a Catholic some 36 years ago, and it never occurred to me. I didn't have enough faith to pray for the, the number of strong, dynamic, faith-filled, mostly lay Catholic ministries, apostolates, podcasts, websites, schools, colleges, you know, and universities 
uh, back then it was like EWTN was just getting started. The, the Franciscan University of Steubenville was just getting started. You could count on one hand the other colleges or universities like Christendom or TAC, Thomas Aquinas College. Now, you know, two hands are not enough. In fact, you practically need a calculator to keep track of all of these things. And I do believe that these also are having a kind of spillover effect, not as much as Hollywood to be certain. But I just met recently with Charval Reich of Parousia Media there in Sydney. He came up for our priests retreat where we had over, uh, I think about 230 priests for five days of intensive workshops and classes and that sort of thing. And it was transformative, not only for them, but for us at the St. Paul Center. And I know that Charbel shared with us about the things that are going on down in Australia. And to be honest, I was stunned. You know, you have the parish renewal conference, but you have so many other things that 10, 15, 20 years ago, you couldn't see anywhere on the map. And so I do believe that it is an example of what we find throughout salvation history, where you have the light and the dark, you know, and it's not simply the good guys versus the bad guys, because as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, we're not just out to reach them. We are them and we were reached by God's mercy and we need to continually be reached again and again so that our conversion is not something that we simply point to as one and done over in the past, but ongoing, ever deepening, lifelong. And even though it sometimes gets harder, it also gets more exciting. And so the drama of life lived in a post-Christian culture is exciting. It is daunting. I think we all feel a general sense of fatigue from all of the crises and the controversies you know, in the world, in our culture, in our church, in the Vatican, and all of that. But it, it's a reminder that we need God's grace today and tomorrow every bit as much as we did 5, 10, 15 years ago, or whenever it was that we underwent our own personal spiritual awakening. But I, I do think that right now, it isn't just the U.S. that's experienced secularization. We hear about Australia, and it seems to be speeding up. And likewise, it's not just in the U.S. that more and more Catholics are catching fire. And so it's also down under that more and more Catholics are waking up to the fact that the good news is far better than we just assumed it was way back when we were getting catechized or going through Catholic schools. And so, you know, the, the drama is increasing. Uh, and I do think that God prefers to do more with less. And so even though we feel great weakness in the face of this tsunami of secularization, nevertheless, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And so who's to say that the grace of renewal and social transformation won't take our great-grandchildren by surprise when they look back and see what we have been going through and then recognize that, yes, in fact, in spite of it all, there was a great awakening. There was a spiritual transformation, not only of more and more individuals, but of families, communities, and cultures. That's my hope. A beautiful, hopeful message, and I think it's I think it's true as well. Um, so, well, speaking of um, of the U.S., uh, we know that the U.S. bishops had their spring retreat. Uh, I think it's only every few years. Is that correct? And our own Archbishop Anthony Fisher preached at that retreat and had a fantastic week, he said. Did you hear anything about that retreat? I did. I heard from, from down under. shepherds and I heard that Archbishop Fisher, not surprisingly, was tremendously well received, but also had an amazing impact on their hearts. You know, we have pledged ourselves to a three-year renewal of Eucharistic faith, and he reinforced that greatly, among other things. But this idea that, well, 70% of Catholics in America believe that the Eucharist is merely a symbol, 30% believe in the real presence, I do believe that's going to change. And in fact, I believe that that will be the catalyst to a transformation that goes beyond just Catholic doctrine or belief about the Eucharist. I think that what will happen, in fact, is that we're going to rise to the level of what Pope St. John Paul II called Eucharistic amazement. He said, Eucharistic faith is not enough. Eucharistic devotion is needed. But what is really called for is Eucharistic amazement. To look at what appears to be bread, 
to profess our belief that this is the resurrected, ascended, glorified body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. It's the same body that was in the upper room. It's the same body that was hanging on the cross and the same body that was buried in the tomb. But what we actually receive is the resurrected body of Christ. It has been transformed, but it also becomes the means by which we will be transformed from sinners to saints. And I think what we'll see through this rediscovery of Eucharistic faith is a kind of amazement where we'll realize that professing our faith in the real presence, transubstantiation, the words of consecration, apostolic succession, and so on and so forth. Okay, more than just Catholic talking points, we're going to realize that these are like sacred mysteries that are like precious gems, only much more valuable and powerful than diamonds and rubies and sapphires. And, you know, as the son of a jeweler, I really believe I'm not making it up. I'm not exaggerating even slightly. My dad, as I grew up, just manufactured rings and would show me what he was sharing so that middle-class ordinary people could have beautiful rings. And, you know, when your dad does something, you just take it for granted, whether it's jewelry, law, insurance. You know, it wasn't until after he died at his funeral that I began to realize, you know, how many people had come to appreciate the beauty of these precious gems. And I think that there's a sense in which the beauty of the sacred mysteries that surround the Holy Eucharist and the Holy Catholic Church and all of the angels and saints, you know, it's almost too good to be true, except it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of what we call the Catholic gospel. And so let's go back to it, allow ourselves to be re-amazed by it, even if that means like defamiliarizing ourselves with it. So we approach it as though it's the first time and suddenly experience a kind of childlike awakening. I really believe that God the Father wants to pour out that particular grace upon his sons and daughters, perhaps more than we want them to. And so I, I think we have solid reasons, again, to be eager and expectant. Can you describe for us the moment when you, you know, as a former Presbyterian minister, when you looked at the Eucharist during Mass and realized that was Jesus present. Yeah, I remember it like it was last week. Um, I was a PhD student uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, studying at Marquette. It was my first semester, and I'd been taking a doctoral seminar where we were looking at the early church, studying in particular what St. Justin Martyr described as the most ancient liturgy. And I was just curious to figure out what, if any, residue or remnant remains in what is called the Catholic Mass, because it sure looked different than the Presbyterian order of, serve, of, of worship that I would conduct. And so I went with a checklist, thinking that maybe a third up to a half of these items might be checked off. Within the first 10 or 15 minutes, though, practically the whole checklist was done. And so I'm waiting to see what happens, and I'm listening to the priest pronounce, well, not just the words of consecration, before that, you had the anaphora, which I knew from antiquity. But then when I heard him express the words of consecration, it was, a, it was suddenly as though all of my doubts were sort of, I don't know how to say it, but draining out of my intellect, my, my head, and I'm, I'm in the back pew staring forward looking at the priest, elevating the consecrated host, and hearing myself whisper under my breath, my Lord and my God, that's you. That's no longer bread. And by the time he got around to consecrating the chalice, and he elevated that, it was as though I, I knew that I knew with a certainty of faith that it was no longer wine. And quite literally, I began to drool with this holy thirst for his precious blood, at the same time, I'm trying to figure out what's happening to me. Is this simply an emotional response? Is it an intellectual awakening? But I realized it was really the seed of a conversion to something more than to a doctrine that I could see the early church professed. But more than that, it was the reality that I was confronting in a totally unexpected way. It was Jesus, whom I had loved, who I had served for several years, as a teenager, as a college student, as a Protestant minister. But now I'm looking at our Lord 
and falling in love with him in the Holy Eucharist in a way that I just never saw coming. And so for the next couple of weeks, I began secretly attending daily Mass, and not only following along in sacred scripture, but really, as I said, falling in love and deepening a friendship with my Lord and my Savior in a way that not only stunned me, but it also sped up my timeline so that instead of taking another four or five years to enter the church, it ended up being more like four or five months before I was received at the Easter Vigil back in 86 at the local parish. Okay, well, well, that's amazing. So maybe I'll ask you then, I was going to ask you something about how can we, because you talk about we need to keep falling in love with, with God, growing in love and walking, walking in love with God. And I was going to ask you, how do we keep falling in love with the God we cannot see? But as you're describing, we do see our Lord in the Eucharist. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a funny thing because when it began to happen to me, I was in my late 20s and early 30s, a Protestant pastor going in search of a church, and then a doctoral student open to the possibility of becoming a Catholic, even though for most of my life as an evangelical, I wasn't just non-Catholic, but very anti-Catholic, and partly because they worship a wafer, you've got to be kidding. And so it was my love of the truth. The truth is what I wanted, no matter what the cost. And so my passion for scripture, my love for the truth, led me to make decisions that I would have thought absurd and unthinkable just a few years earlier. But now I find myself as a husband of 43 years, as the father of six, with my oldest turning 40 this year, and he's now Dr. Han, a professor of scripture at the largest seminary in the U.S., Mount St. Mary's, and Father Jeremiah, our other son who's now been ordained, with 21 grandkids. It's one thing to love the truth and to want it no matter what. It's another thing to kind of crack the code of Catholic teaching and to discover that I've moved from this passionate love of the truth to discover the passionate truth of love, that the content of the faith is that God loves us far more than we can imagine, and that this is the only logic that integrates and unites all of the, all of the doctrines that we profess in the creed and what we affirm and try to live out as, as Catholics. And so, to realize that the Father has sent the Son, the Word has become flesh to dwell among us, to die, to rise for us, but then also to baptize and to feed us with his own Eucharistic body, blood, soul, and divinity, to make us members of his mystical body in a way that is more than metaphorical. It's more than a figure of speech. I mean, I'm looking at my fingers and my hands and my arms. They're part of my body. But what we discover is that through the Holy Eucharist, we are parts of Christ's body more than these fingers and hands and arms are parts of my body because these will decompose in 50 or 60 years or if not sooner. But what we share in the body of Christ makes us the mystical body of Christ really and truly forever and ever. And it's like the best is definitely yet to come. And we're going to find out that what we have professed to be true is truer than we realized but our love of truth is going to be transformed to the truth of love, that the content of every single doctrine is that God's love for us is eternal, it's fiery, and it's out of control. I mean, as St. Jose Marie would say, he is madly in love with us, and that's the only way to make sense out of everything that we profess and try to live. And it's why we have confidence that even though we're still weak, his strength will get us home. Well, I think we'll leave it there, although I could, I could, um, yeah, that was definitely worth getting up for, Dr. Dr. Hannah. Uh -huh. That was fantastic. I'm sure everyone's going to be so pleased to, um, to hear all of our wonderful speakers next week, um, including yourself. So thank you again for your time, being so generous with, with those amazing, beautiful insights that you've gained, not, not only after, after all, all your study and everything you've done with the church, but your marriage to Kimberly. Um, has been that great source of truth and love for you. So it's, thank you so much for sharing all of that, you and Kimberly, with all of us. Oh, Marilyn, you are most welcome. But also thank you for your time. What a joy it's been to have this conversation. Beautiful. All right. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you too. Mm -hmm.